It seems like everyone is talking about energy these days, and rightly so. There's a lot happening in the industry right now because there's a lot of future demand and net zero goals to contend with. Just ask Claire Harris, an advisor with New Brunswick Power. She is seeing a shift in consumers' interest and how we consume power and where it's coming from. Let's hear what she has to say. Hi, Claire. Welcome to Reimagined Energy. Good morning, Maria. It's nice to see you. Um, tell us about your role at MB Power. All right. Uh, I've been with MB Power a long time. Um, I started uh, my career in 1989 at the Belden Generating Station after I graduated from Power Engineering Technology, and I've been with MB Power ever since. Um, so starting off my career in a Coal fire at station, and uh, I'm now with the Advanced Reactor Development Program. I'm a senior advisor in the area of environment and inclusion. Awesome. So, what shifts have you seen in the past ten years in the energy sector? Well, it's been interesting. You know, as the world kind of wakes up to the impacts of uh, burning fossil fuels, yeah. we're seeing that uh, you know renewables and uh, clean energy sources, including nuclear are really becoming much more accepted mm -hmm. and mainstream. So although I've been working in the nuclear industry for the last 15 years, uh, we're just seeing a lot more activity. And so over the last five years, I've been working on the Advanced Reactor Development Program. And uh, we are just, you know, the, the world is starting to see that, you know, we can't get to net zero with renewables alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look for base load power, nuclear is it. So we're seeing a huge shift towards nuclear energy. Interesting, mm -hmm. because also energy demand is growing, you know, with the use of electric vehicles on the market, there's a lot more drain or strain on, on the, uh, the way that energy is being consumed. What needs to happen to prepare for the future? Yes, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot in front of us. And um, I, I think the good news is the technology is there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we all really need to just lean in together and, and understand how to use the existing technology. And we're looking at, um, you know, many, there's been many workshops happening across Canada to look at how to get to net zero by 2050. And uh, most of those workshops are, are showing that electricity requirements are going to, you know, double or two and a half times that of what we mm -hmm. have today. Wow. And so how do we prepare for that? Uh, we need to actually look at all of the tools in our toolbox. We need to look for, to wind, solar, uh, hydro, nuclear, the four key uh, existing technologies for, uh, for for clean energy. And we need to look at storage and newer technologies like geothermal and, uh, and biofuels. Interesting, because the grid stability, you know, is important. You know, there's going to be peaks and valleys, and so that needs to happen. So what projects are happening in the region? I guess the, uh, you know, the Atlantic Canada region, uh, that can ensure that power is consistent. Right. So we are, um, and I'm, I'm going to give it from, uh, you know, give you my perspective from New Brunswick's point of view, and mm -hmm. that's really where my focus is. But I will assume that Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland are all looking at, uh, you know, their own integrated resource plans for their provinces and how all of the interconnections work. And so we, we do buy power from Quebec. Uh, we will be strengthening our, our ties to Quebec. Uh, strengthening our ties to Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia. And so we need to make sure that the grid, um, you know, the infrastructure of the grid remains, um, you know, that the maintenance is carried out and that that remains strong for us. But now what do we put on that grid is just as important. I'll give you an example of, of what we have to look at when, when we're looking at grid stability. Uh, we had uh, the coldest day of the year was February 4th of 2023, and that's where we hit our peak. Mm -hmm. And we needed uh, approximately 4,000 megawatts of energy uh, to meet that peak demand. Uh, we had very little wind available to us because, you know, it was very windy. The wind was howling through the province and wind turbines don't operate well under high winds or low winds. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's the middle of the night. There's not a lot of solar energy required. So we had to use all of the resources that, you know, that we had in our 
at, uh, at our disposal. I would assume that Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador will be looking at that same requirement. You know, how do we meet our demands, especially mm-hmm. in the winter time for Canada? Um, and so how do we keep our grid stable and how do we provide clean energy to that grid? It's right. a, it's a, you know, it's complicated, but it's, it's doable. Yes. Yeah. It sounds like it's, 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 it, you say it's doable, but it sounds daunting. Like it just, to me, it does, but I, I'm sure you guys have it all in hand. <laughs> so there's a lot of people working on it for sure. And definitely uh, making sure that the strategy is there and that, uh, that we're going to um, have the power available to people. When they need and there's it. a lot of smart people working on it too, from my experience, from what I'm seeing from my angle. More and more people are considering where their where their power is coming from, you know, the average person and and also the environmental impact. How do we include, you know, the average person in, in the energy conversation? Like, is it educators? Is it uh, curriculum? You know, what energy means? It's so important that we all have this conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm probably not the person that gets invited to dinner parties sometimes because maybe I want to talk about energy a little too often. Oh, I'd love uh, to have it's you. It's so important that we all understand, <laughs> you know, wh- where's our energy coming from? And, and, you know, when we don't have it, that's when we think about it. It's like, oh, oh my yeah. goodness, where's, you know, when is it coming back on? Um, yeah. but it's, uh, you know, for all of us to lean into the conversation about how do we get to net zero by 2050? How do we actually all work together? Uh, for a solution, we all need to understand what's involved, and uh, and so I, I I think up until recently, the energy conversation has been left with those uh, engineers and scientists and energy strategy people, um, probably to the detriment of understanding for everyone to understand what does it take to have clean energy into your home, into your lives, into your hospitals and your schools and your industries. Um, and so we're trying to shift that. We um, we have been bringing educators to the station uh, for a conversation around energy. What does energy you know, look like, how do we get it? And then we take them for, you know, a, a walk through the nuclear power plant to say, this is what nuclear power really looks like. It's not really maybe what you imagine. It's clean. It is, uh, you know, pristine really. And that's one of the comments we typically get from the educators is I didn't realize how clean this was going to be. And uh, and so we, we want them to understand this is how energy is made. This is what it really looks like when you're in the power plant. And these are all of the operators that work here, high degree of, uh, of professionalism at the nuclear power plant. And so we want them to understand you can see a windmill and you can see a solar panel right. on a on a you know a rooftop. But you don't often get a chance to actually see a nuclear power plant and what's involved. And also, you know, taking people to mm-hmm. see a, a coal fire plant or a, a hydro plant. It's important for people to see, OK, this is where my power is made. And then it gets transmitted to the lines and then it makes it to my home. We often think of the line and the home, right. not necessarily the plant where it's actually coming from. Yeah, that's correct. That's important. It, it is definitely. Where does diversity inclusion fit into the climate change conversation? As I said um, a little earlier, oftentimes we've left the energy conversation with those professionals, the engineers and the scientists and the the energy strategists, um, and uh, you know, and, and it hasn't really served us that well. We are still struggling with um, having more women in um, in energy production. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I joined, you know, MD Power back in uh, 1989, you know, very few women were operators. Uh, very few women were, you know, electrical engineers and civil engineers, mechanical engineers. The engineering has gotten, uh, you know, we've, we've been getting higher numbers, but we're still only at about 18 to 20 percent mm-hmm. women in the nuclear or in the energy industry. And yeah. so we need to improve on that. But we I believe and, you know, I'm biased, of course, because I'm a woman, but I believe we need more women in the conversation. Because, um, you know, we're going to we're going to have a different conversation. Women typically uh, will be looking to the future of their children and their grandchildren. And, you know, what does this mean for for my family? Men do, too. But women tend to be a little bit more focused on the future generations. Mm -hmm. And definitely indigenous people are 
focused on, you know, seven generations out. And so we've been trying to do our environmental studies from an Indigenous lens. Uh, We've been trying really hard to have an Indigenous inclusion aspect to all of the work we do. Indigenous women, you know, when you get that mixture and, and, and you have those conversations, it's just a different conversation. And we need to have all of them. We need to have all of the conversations um, and we all need to trust that we're all in this together and we're working together for future generations. Absolutely. Totally agree with that one. In your professional opinion, what do the next five to 10 years look like? So the next five to 10 years, I believe, are going to be um, that period of time when we're actually all trying to figure out how do we do this together. Mm-hmm. Where renew, we, I, I'm a, a member of Women in Renewable Energy. I'm a member of One Million Women, uh, Women in Nuclear, Women in Energy. There's lots of opportunities to actually get involved there. Uh, but there's also, you know, many, many other professionals that are looking at how do we do this? How do we solve this issue of getting to net zero by 2050 and trying to collaborate and pull all of these networks together so that we're all having actually a, a, a progressive conversation, a positive conversation about how do we solve the issue, mm-hmm. not how do we be divisive. I, you know, we need to stop the division and we need to stop saying it's this or it's that. It's everything. Anything that is considered to be a clean energy source needs to be included in the conversation. And we need to start knitting it all together so that we can actually, you know, build the, the solution. Uh, together. So I think the next 10 years will be identifying what the solutions are, coming together to actually put project plans together, getting our licensing plans in place, getting our environmental assessments done so that we can actually do the demonstration, you know, of this is how these plants will operate. This is how they will integrate to the grid. This is how they will help to decarbonize industries such as refineries and pulp and paper mills, steel mills and other mills like that, because that's another area that we have to actually you know, solve for. And then I'd say for the next five to 10 years, it's that solution stage. And then after that, it will be building so that we can actually make sure that we are creating a future for future generations. Definitely collaboration. That's, that's, that's the key, the key message Absolutely. is working together for the common, for our common goal. Mm -hmm. Claire, I want to thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. I loved having you and having this brief conversation. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd I'd love to learn more um, about the diversity inclusion. And I'd love to have some people on a future episode, you know, um, to talk to and, and just have those conversations with those people. Very important. We're all diverse. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Have a, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. The big takeaway from today's conversation with Claire was collaboration with everyone. Thank you for tuning in today's podcast. I would love to see you back or subscribe to Reimagined Energy. But in the meantime, I'm your host, Maria McGowan.